Rick Easel says this regarding joy. He says, where's the joy? He says, who can, uh, he who cla- we who claim to have joy, we often look as if we've been weaned on dill pickles. He says, the joy, 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 way down in the depths of our heart has long departed, and in its place, some sort of ugliness that emerges like a bad taste in our mouths is here. He says, many Christians once possessed a vibrant and exciting faith, an upbeat and positive attitude, and confident with certain joyfulness. He says, the fullness of their joy has been drained like a swimming pool. While these people have not lost the experience of salvation, they've lost the joy of their salvation. He asks, where did it go? What caused joy to evaporate from their lives? Jesus said in John 15, 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Rick Easel goes on to say, this fullness of joy, it eludes most committed Christians. Many Christians have exchanged the experience of joy for the weight of counterfeits. For some Christians, The thief of their joy is legalism. Legalism is the perverted theology that reduces Christianity to a set of rules loaded with guilt-inducing mechanisms. It robs the believer of joy. It transforms their relationship with Christ to merely religiosity. It points out how short we fall rather than how far we've come because of what Jesus Christ has done. And in this passage that's before us tonight, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi to address that it's Jesus, it's not legalism. Ask yourselves, how much guilt do you walk around with on a daily basis? Maybe even you came into church tonight carrying some guilt. Ask yourself, why do you carry around day after day week after week, maybe even month after month, maybe some of you year after year, carrying around this guilt. Well, we have the title of our message tonight is Losing My Religion, Part 2. Because we know that religion doesn't bring us closer to Jesus Christ. J. Vernon McGee says that God is not looking for a mere external observance. Religion says What can I do to to, to inherit something? What can I I do to to make God love me? What can I do to to make things better? But it's interesting that in our text tonight, it's not about what we can do, but it's about what Jesus Christ has done. So if you've not turned there yet, turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 4 through 8 tonight. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 4, says this. Paul says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, he says, I more so. Listen to what he says here. Verse 5, he says, I've circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he says, blameless. Let's stop there for just a few moments for what Paul is going to do for us. is he going, He's going to give us a great example of his former life. We hear, number two, that it was all about him. We just read that Paul said that if anyone was to have confidence, which means full trust in the flesh, I should have confidence because I was circumcised the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. He has a pretty impressive resume. So what is the Apostle Paul saying? He's saying, I did everything right. You see, the tribe of Benjamin, they gave Israel its first king. Uh, Being a Hebrew of Hebrews means that he was of pure Jewish descent. Of being a Pharisee. Who were they? They were a strict sect who held firmly to the traditions. Listen to this. To the Pharisee, keeping the law, both written and oral, it was everything. 
The condition of a person's heart towards God was unimportant to them. Because of their strict adherence to the Levitical laws of purity, they kept themselves separate from Gentile sinners on whom they looked down upon because they didn't want to be defiled. The Pharisees placed great importance on temple worship, on going to church, doing the church thing, but they had no personal relationship with God. Their worship was merely a form of religious observance. They paid no attention to the motives of the heart, which led to self-righteousness and hypocrisy. Jesus dedicates Matthew 23, that entire chapter, to rebuking the religious of his day. An entire chapter detailing how the Pharisees are wrong and how they are missing the mark. Have you noticed thus far in our text and the Apostle Paul's really impressive resume, he doesn't for one time mention joy. You get that? He didn't mention joy at all. He says, hey, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm this. I was circumcised. Hey, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. But he doesn't mention that these things brought me joy. It sounds great on paper, but it doesn't say that it brought him joy, that adhering to any of these rules and regulations brought him joy. This reminds me of a story found in Matthew chapter 19. I'll read that to you, or if you want to turn left, feel free to. Matthew chapter 19, it's called the, the rich young ruler. And this background is a, this guy obviously is rich and he's a young ruler, but he comes to Jesus, although he's rich and also he's a ruler, and he asks Jesus a really interesting question in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. He says this, it says, Now behold, one came and said to Jesus, Well, good, che- che- te- well, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life. Let's stop there for a second. What good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus says to him, well, first of all, why do you call me good? There's no one good but one, and that's God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, well, which ones? And Jesus says, well, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, Honor your mother and father, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the young man said to him, well, hey, this is great, because all of these things I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Let's think about this for a second. You've got money. That's not an issue. You've kept all of the commands since you were a little little boy. Why are you coming to Jesus? If the law would would fulfill you, if the, wall, if the law would be all that one would need, why are you coming to Jesus asking what you can do to inherit eternal life? Because you've already done what, quote-unquote, Jesus has asked of you. And it's interesting if you've not caught it, Jesus didn't give him all the Ten Commandments. He only gave them a couple. He didn't talk about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Jesus goes on, it says in verse 21, Jesus said to him, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. So the man says, I'm obviously lacking something. What can I do? Jesus says, well, give away all that you have, and you want to find this eternal life? Just just come follow me. There's nothing that you have to do. Just, just, Just come follow me. And I wonder why this man, the Bible says that, He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He wanted to know, what could I do to inherit? Jesus says, just sell it all and just come follow me. He had everything that he could ever want, but he didn't have eternal life. The law didn't give it to him. His money didn't give it to him. Jesus simply said, do this and come follow me. And he was willing to walk away sorrowful. So I have a question for you. If you were this guy in the story, what would Jesus say? What would be that that one thing that you're holding on to that you're thinking that's going to bring you life, but it hasn't brought you joy, it hasn't brought you peace? What's that one thing that he would say? Just get rid of that one thing, because just maybe that one thing is stealing your joy. Just maybe that one thing is getting in the way of your relationship with God. Oh, you're keeping the commandments. You're coming to church. Just like this young rich ruler, 
but still yet he found himself lacking. If you came in here and you're carrying some, some bricks of, of guilt, ask yourself, what is it that you might be lacking? What is it that you are not believing? It's like going to the doctor. You go to the doctor and you say, hey, doctor, I'm sweating at night. You know, I can't keep anything down. I'm coughing up some, some colorful stuff. I'm just not feeling really good, doctor. I need you to fix me. So the doctor, you know, puts a little thing around your arm and pumps it up, takes your blood pressure, looks in your eyes, he looks in your ears, and he says, oh, you got to clean all that stuff out there. He checks you out, right? He says, okay, you've got this horrible infection. Go home and take this, and you'll feel better. Whoa, doctor, you know what? I don't really like pills, you know? I'll let this whole thing run its course. No, 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 just take the pills. This is what... This will make you better. No, 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 I don't want to do that, doctor. This rich young ruler did all the rules. Jesus told him how he could find life, but he was unwilling to do so. I wonder what we are unwilling to do tonight to find joy in Jesus. I wonder where our confidence is placed. Paul's former life, his confidence was placed in his resume. I wonder if we tend to do the same because I've heard things like, well, I'm a good person. You ever heard that? You might be a good person compared to the person on your left or right, but none of us are a good person compared to Jesus Christ. We've heard that my parents are Christians and, you know, I was raised in the church and, you know, my grandfather was a deacon. Well, what does that got to do with you? What has that got to do with anything? Nothing. That's the way that we kind of give our little resume, well, you know, I'm not that bad of a person. I don't really need God because I'm just not that bad. You see, when everything is about you, when everything is about your works, you're going to find out exactly what the Apostle Paul found out, that he was incorrect, that he was ignorant. In verse 6, it says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Zeal means to have great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause. He was persecuting the church. He was arresting people. He was killing people. Listen to what it says in Acts chapter 9 about Paul's former life when he was Saul. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This was his religion. This was the zeal that drove him to murder and to persecute the church. He goes on further and he says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He was pretty much saying, hey, look at me. This is all good. Keep the law. Everything is fine. My life is spotless. All my ducks are in a row. I'm keeping the law. I am totally righteous. When Paul met Jesus Christ, all of that changed. First Timothy, he wrote to him, and he says this to Timothy. He says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Listen to verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul didn't start to write about faith. He didn't start to write about joy until he met Jesus Christ. Before he met Jesus, it was all about the law. It was all about what I could do. But the moment he meets Jesus Christ, he can write to the Philippian church talking about rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. He can write about faith because before then, with his old life, all he had was rules and more rules and regulations and things to do and things not to do. What about your life? Most of you probably know Jesus Christ, but how many of you are still living by all of these rules to earn God's love, to earn God's approval, to maybe even earn God's affection for you? So when you stumble and fall, you tend to carry around these bricks. God, I'm horrible. I don't see how you could love me, God. I keep doing this thing over and over and over again. So you carry another brick. Tomorrow, you guys will wake up, hopefully pray before you start your day, but you'll do something wrong, and you'll pick up that same brick of guilt, and you'll pile it on the rest. God, 
I'm messing up again, God. How can you love someone like me? I'm sure we got a few of those folks sprinkled around through the room. It's all about what you can do. It's all about your performance. God, I'm going to be good today. I'm not going to do anything wrong today, God. I'm going to please you today, God. God, today was a pretty good day. It's lunchtime. I haven't done that one thing. I haven't looked at that one person. I haven't said this one thing. God, you're going to bless me now, right? You're going to do something good, right? I deserve something good now, God. I want you to, to, to bless me. I wonder if that's how our walk with God is on a daily basis. I want to do good so God can bless me. I'm going to try really hard not to mess up so God can love me, so God can bless me. That's why when things go wrong in our lives, we blame ourselves, right? What did I do? Right? We can be honest, right? Anybody in the house ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You eight or nine know what we're talking about, right? Something goes wrong. What did I do? What did I do for this to happen wrong? Maybe it's that one thing. Maybe God is punishing me for something again. That's real, right? That's what we think sometimes. What is it that I have done? That's righteousness that we're looking at. That it's something that I have done that will make God love me more or make God to, to punish me. You see, when it's about all of our works, we're wrong. When it's about what we have done, we're wrong. It's all about what Jesus Christ has done, that we are new creations in Jesus Christ. Now, you may look in the mirror and say, oh, man, I don't look like a new creation. I need some, some help in this area, God. I'm not feeling so much joy, and this is not new, God. I've been living with this for a couple years. The Bible says you are a new creation. Think about this. You're brand new. What does the Bible say? The old has passed away. Amen? The old is gone, right? So why are you still dwelling on it? Why are you still carrying it in your pocket? Something happens, you're like, oh yeah, it's still here with me. Because you don't believe that you're a new creation. If all things have become new, why are you still thinking like the old person? Why are you still living under that same type of legalism? God doesn't want us to live like that. That's why we probably don't have any joy because we're always looking to what we used to do, always looking to where we used to be. So if we're following Jesus, we have to ask, God, am I living with legalism? Am I living just to make sure I don't make any mistakes? If your righteousness is found in observing rules, your righteousness is found in what you are doing in your external. But Paul tells the Galatian church this. He says, knowing that a man is not justified, which means making, being made righteous in God's sight, by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. I wonder if God just wants us to relax. Gonna be okay, Henry. Life's tough, but you're gonna make it. Don't stress out, just simply relax. Do you believe in me? Yes, I do. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes, I have, God. My son has died for your sins. Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Have you repented of your sins? Yes, I have. Well, then relax. It's going to be okay. Let all the guilt go. Let all the legalism of, 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 of God, I'm going to be perfect for you today. Let all that go and simply rest in what my son has done for you. It's so hard for us to rest because we're all working and thinking about stuff. Some of you, although you're sitting right here, you're already at work. You're already working at work. Some of you are already doing this, answering phones, thinking about your in basket. Some of you are already at home cooking dinner. Some of you are already putting your kids to bed because your mind is constantly going and going and going that we don't know what it's like to rest in Jesus. We don't know what it's like to rest in the finished work of the cross. Let me tell you this, no matter what you do from this point on, whether good, bad, or indifferent, God will never love you any more than he does right now. 
But yet some of you will keep working, trying to be good. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippi because these dogs he talked about last week were coming into the church saying, you know what, it's not enough to just have faith in Jesus. You've got to be circumcised. I wonder what you have tacked on to, be, to being a Christian. Well, it's not really enough for me to believe. You know, I now have to read three chapters a day. I have to, you know, pray, you know, for two hours in the morning. I have to be good. I have to come to church. I have to take notes. I have to do this. I have to open doors. All of these things we've tacked on to having faith in Jesus. When God just says faith in Jesus alone is enough. That's why we have all of these bricks and guilts and all of this legalism because we continue to add to what God has done. Last week, we, they added what, 600 and what, 12, something crazy like that? More, more rules to, to, to make sure they don't break 10? That's our human nature. Let me just keep adding all of these things so I don't disappoint God. And I wonder sometimes if God just says, just, just sit down. Just, you're doing too much. Just, just sit down. I've got everything taken care of. I've got everything covered. Because when the Apostle Paul found out that it was number three, it was all about Jesus. Listen to what he says in verse 7. He says, but what things were gain to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. All of my worldly strivings, all of my keeping the law, all of my being born of the tribe of Benjamin, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, being a Pharisee, all of these things, he says, I've counted them as loss for Christ. He says it no longer matters that I no longer find my identity in the things that I do, but I found my identity in Jesus Christ. What about you? What is your identity found in? Is it found in just being a really good worker? Is it found in being just a, a, a great person? Or is your identity found in Jesus Christ? On Sunday, Pastor Tom talked about uh, being a servant. All of us want to be servants of God, right? But all of us hate when people treat us like a servant, is what he said. So, if your identity is found in Jesus Christ, treat me like you want to, because it's not what you think about me that really matters anything. Amen? It's what Jesus thinks about me, because one day I will make all of you upset, probably. That Henry pastor guy, he's blah, 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 blah. Now we're having fun, right? But there might come a day where I might say something where you might just get bent. You don't want to talk to me anymore. You're not going to wave. Because our relationship is conditional. It's based upon how I make you or don't make you feel. If I don't upset you, like, oh, great service. Make you mad. Not sure if you're going to come back, right? I think I'll take a Wednesday or two off, you know, just that. that yeah, I'm not sure. He's a little off. My identity is not in you guys. I care about you, but I care about what God thinks about me because it doesn't change. It's constant. It's steady. It's true. It's real. It's based upon his love for me, not what I can do for him. And it's so important to understand, church, that it must be all about Jesus Christ and him alone. If your walk is just about Jesus, how much guilt can you have you're walking around with forgiveness by your side. You're walking around with the remembrance that Jesus has died for you and he loves you. So why is it that we're depressed? Why is it that we're guilty? Why is it that we have a hard time finding joy when he's right here? He's right here. Just maybe our focus isn't where it should be, on God. Just maybe our focus is wrong, but the Apostle Paul says, you know what? I had it wrong. It's all about Jesus, and I've exchanged all of this for Christ, and I've considered it as a loss. What would you be willing to exchange tonight for Christ, to have that joy, to, to get rid of those bricks, to get rid of that guilt? What would you be willing to exchange those weights of legalism that you've been carrying around? Would you be willing to exchange those for, for some joy? That means you would be powerless to continue to stress out about that one thing that still will never change no matter how much you think about it. What if you'll be willing to exchange that tonight for joy? Jesus, here's that thing that I've been thinking about. I want to exchange that for some joy.
And that's what we find here at our next point. We find a great exchange. The Apostle Paul says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, I count all things as loss. His nice resume, his life before he met Christ, all of that meant nothing. He exchanged that for the knowledge of Christ. I'm glad all of you are here, and I'm glad we're in our word, because this is knowledge. This helps our thinking to be right when we're, woe is me, I failed you again, God. What does the word say? It says, no, I've been justified. And in case you guys don't know, our sin issue was nailed to something that looks like that. It was nailed to the cross. So our sin issue has been taken care of. That Jesus Christ on the cross, he says, to telestai. He says, it is finished. You know what finished means? It's done. There's nothing else to do. So if our sin issue has been taken care of, why is it that when we stumble and when we fall, we act as if Jesus has not died for us. We act as if we must do something in order to merit God's love. What we need to do is we need to exchange that type of thinking for this type of preaching. Exchange that, this right here, for this right here. Because this right here tells me that it's all about Jesus Christ. It's not about what I can do. Jeremiah the prophet, he says this, the Lord says this through Jeremiah. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. If we're going to boast about anything, may we boast that I know Jesus Christ and that he knows my name. As awesome as that is, my boasting is not going to be in what I have done, what I haven't done, in my faults and in my failures. My glory isn't in that. So if our glory should not be in our mistakes, why do we focus so much on them? Why do we focus in so much on the things that we struggle with? I wonder if God says, take your eyes off of these things and get them back on me. I think sometimes we must like to just to hurt ourselves where we're just thinking about things over and over and over and over again when God says, don't you know who I am? The Bible says that we're heirs with Christ. He says we're seated in high places. He says that there's nothing that will ever separate us from his love, but yet we walk around as if we're orphans. We walk around as if, as if God doesn't love us. We walk around as if joy is based upon how good I do on a certain day. You ever have that day where things go pretty well? And what? You feel good about yourself. Think about that. When you feel you've done okay, you feel like your day has gone pretty good. You're like, hey, today was a good day. Why wasn't yesterday a good day? Just because you feel you're not sinning or you're not doing anything wrong, you're now saying, it's a good day. When I feel like I'm doing the right thing, that's called legalism, church. That's called I'm going to keep on doing good, and God must love me if I keep on doing good. Jeremiah says, no, don't glory in these things, but glory that you know God. And I pray that that is your glory, that you know Jesus Christ. Well, verse 8, the latter part says, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ. We have here a great perspective. Some of your Bibles, if you have the King James Version, it says, I count them as dung, excrement poop. <laughs> That's what it is. I count all of these things, all of my past successes as poop. They, they mean nothing. They mean nothing to me. All of these strivings for worldly recognition, all of these strivings to be religious, I count all of this as dung, he says, that I might gain Christ. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a Pharisee. All of my pursuits nothing they mean nothing in comparison to christ that i might gain christ i'm not going to hold on to anything any longer i'm not going to hold on to 
my legalistic ways that I might gain Christ. Paul's perspective was so important because it's all about knowing Jesus, not about what he has done or what he has accomplished. I guess the question is, what's most important to you, your accomplishments or knowing Christ? Because when we know Christ, I believe the accomplishments will come and our glory will go to God and to God alone. That when we get a raise at work, it's not like, yeah, I've been working really hard, 50 hours a week, I've been coming in early, staying late. That's all you. But when your boss says, you know what? Good job. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for finding me faithful. Thank you for waking me up in the morning and helping me to get to work on time. All glory goes to you, God. Nothing goes to me. When we have the right perspective, when we know that what's most important for us and to us, that's when the change comes. Matthew tells us this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and then he hid. And for joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys a field. What if there was a field in your backyard or wherever you live? It just said joy, but it was for sale. What would you be willing to give to buy that field? What would you be willing to exchange to have that joy? Would you start thinking in your life, okay, what are some of the things that are robbing me of joy? Okay. This thing is here, that's there, that's there. Some of you are willing to keep thinking about stuff versus exchanging stuff. The Apostle Paul says, I, I count it all as, as loss for Christ. This man here in this parable, he found his joy and he did something about it. He sold everything just that he might have this joy. I wonder if our problem is we like to hold on to things. We like to be in control. Any backseat drivers we've got going on here? Amen. You're going too slow? I wouldn't go that way. I hope you see the car stopping in front of you. I don't know what you're doing. You're grabbing that imaginary little handle here that's not there. You just can't drive. You know what? Just let me do it. Let me, let me drive because it seems that you were incapable of driving to the place where we've lived for the last 10 years. You're doing it wrong. So you're sitting there, not at being in control, but you're thinking about it. <sighs> doing your whole ear thing. Because you're not in control. Maybe your walk with God is kind of like the same thing. You're not in control and it bothers you. So what do you do? You think and think and think on these things and you worry and worry and worry. You fret when you fail. I've got to do better, God. I've got to do better, God. Just maybe God says, I've got everything under control. You've got to learn to be on the passenger side because we've not learned to rest in God. We've not learned to say, God, you know me inside and out. God, you know I'm going to mess up tomorrow. But he still loves me right now. He'll never love me any greater than he does right now, even though I'm going to blow it tomorrow. And I don't even know it yet, but I'm telling you I'm going to mess up tomorrow. But God says, I love you. It's not about what you can do for me. It's what about Jesus, what Jesus has done for you. So my prayer is that you be willing to exchange all of your legalism. God, I've got to do this for you. I've got to put all these things in a row for you, God. I pray that you will be willing to exchange all of those things for what Christ has done for us on the cross. I pray that you'll be willing to exchange maybe the anger to gain Christ. That you'll be willing to exchange the unforgiveness to gain Christ. That you'll be willing to exchange the works and the legalism to gain Christ. So are you willing to exchange the doing things your way for Christ? This should be our perspective. No fear, as we sang about tonight, because of what Jesus Christ has done. 
May we gladly lose our religion. May we gladly lose our religiosity. May we gladly lose that, I've done this good, I've done this good, and exchange that for what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Because if what Jesus Christ has done on the cross is not enough for you, what's going to be enough for you? You're going to keep trying to be good. You're going to keep trying to do all of these good things, and it will never be enough for you. The Apostle Paul is warning the church at Philippi. It's about Jesus Christ and about him alone. So I want to leave you with a couple of things that we need to take home. It's not enough to know Jesus is enough. We have to believe he's enough. It's not enough to have it here if you don't have it here. We must believe that Jesus Christ and what he has done is enough to save you, enough to clean you up, and enough to get us to heaven, amen? Because when we get to heaven and God says, hey, give it a second. Why should I let you into my heaven? It's great back here. Why do you, why should you come in here? Well, you know, I went to 412 church and I never missed a Wednesday night, God. That's got to mean something, right, God? I never cut anybody off, God. I paid my tithes and offerings. I was at church every Sunday, God. That's got to mean something, right? I was nice to people, God. I didn't always cheat on my taxes, God, but, you know, a little issue, but my trying was enough, God, right? No. Sorry, none of those were the correct answer, sir, ma'am. When we meet God, our creator, the only answer or statement to the question of why should you come into my heaven, God, I am not deserving at all. However, there is this man named Jesus Christ, your son. I love that guy. He has radically transformed me. He's washed me. He's done some great things in my life. My life is in him. I can do nothing but to hold on to what he has done for me. I deserve nothing, but I love him. And based upon what you said, if I place my faith and trust in him, I have everything. Jesus plus zero equals everything. So I'm not sure where you are tonight with your walk with God, but Jesus plus zero equals everything. One day, all of us, will meet God. For most of us, it'll be a great day. For some, it may not be so great if your life isn't hid in Christ. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, it's not going to be a good day because you are standing on your own merits. You're standing on what you have done, your rules and regulations, your legalism. You know what God says about our legalism? It means nothing. The Bible says that our good works are as filthy rags Do a little research on what that means. That's not a beautiful thing. God, here's my, all of my works. It's about Jesus and Jesus alone. So a few things to take home with you. The first one is fight the legalism within you. All of us have this thing in us that says I must do something. Fight that. Rest in what Jesus has done. Maybe some of you here tonight don't go drink coffee at Maybe some of you don't go to Carl's Jr. Maybe some of you don't go shopping at some certain places because that just wouldn't be the Christian thing to do. Let me tell you this. If we were to boycott all of the places that didn't agree with the Bible, we would starve. (laughs) We would walk to work. I think somehow the Bible says that we are to be what of the world? One more time. We're to be lights of the world. So when you go to places like Starbucks, you should be a light to that place. When you go to to Carl's Jr. and they have the most fantastic chocolate cakes. So I go to Carl's Jr. because I love those chocolate cakes with the little frosting on top of it. Bringing my light in there. Light of Jesus Christ. May I have a chocolate cake, please? I am okay with that. Because it's not about legalism. It's not about where I can't go. I should go everywhere because I'm taking Jesus Christ with me. So when I pay my $1.50 for my chocolate cake, God bless you. Goodbye. When I go to Starbucks, God bless you. Thank you for making my coffee. 
Praise the Lord. Have a great day. Jesus loves you. I'm taking the gospel with where I go. But some of you are like, I'm not going there. (laughs) If you don't go there and preach the gospel, who else is going to go there? Just think, a few little time ago, you weren't so beautiful, right? You weren't all cleaned up and dressed up in your church clothes. A few little time ago, you were cursing, drinking, smoking, doing drugs, sleeping around. You were, you were a little out there too. But somebody gave you what? The gospel, right? Somebody didn't let that legalism, oh, this guy has tattoos and earrings, you know. Oof. Let me skip him. God bless that guy. Let me go to someone that doesn't look as messed up. That's legalism. Somebody gave all of us the gospel, and it changed our lives. I want to encourage you, give the gospel at Starbucks. Give the gospel at Carl's Jr. Give the gospel at Lowe's or wherever you go, just by being a Christian, by being a great witness. Start tipping right. Do the right things. Do the right things that speak of Christ and not live this legalistic attitude. So when you find yourself being legalistic, say, God, help me. Help me not be legalistic. It's about what Jesus has done, not what I can do. It's about Jesus and not about me. And then lastly, find quiet places often. Hey, Brother Dennis, you can come back if you're ready. Find quiet places often. Find a place where you can just get alone with God and just just be. Just no cell phones. (gasps) They're not going to be able to get a hold of me. The world is going to fall apart. I must have my cell phone with me. Do you guys ever leave your cell phone at home and you get those phantom, phantom <laughs> rings? You're like, I know my phone is not with me, but did my leg just vibrate? No, no. I'm glad it's not just me. Too attached to your phone. Go to Idlewild on a mountain. Leave your cell phone in the car. Everything is going to be okay. Take your Bible. Take a piece of paper and say, God, I want you to speak to me, God. God, I want to listen to what you have to say to me. Because we're always going, 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 and we wonder why we're so legalistic. We never allow God an opportunity to truly speak to us, to truly say, you're messing up right here. Stop being so legalistic. It's about my son, Jesus Christ, not about what you've done. You can have hope in Jesus, so stop glorifying yourself and all of these accomplishments and achievements that it's only about my son, Jesus Christ. But friends and family, you must be willing to exchange all of those legalistic things for Jesus. Are you willing to do that? Those of you that are here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have an option. You can leave the same way you've come in. Hopefully we had a pretty good time. You laughed a little bit. You heard God's word. But are you willing to exchange your old life for a new life? Are you willing to lay down that legalistic person and pick up Jesus? I pray your answer would be yes.